So each day um, I'd wonder, you know, what new cognition or discovery is going to unfold in today's session. And I must I must point out that um, it's often been stated that at least 50% of the gains come in Scientology come from training as well as auditing. And I think that a very high percentage of gains are available from auditing PCs and uh, seeing what they cognite on and cogniting on it yourself at the same time. I know that's never been stated particularly by anybody, um, but it's very true. I used to have a tremendous number of cognitions sitting there auditing him, and he'd be running something, and then he'd say, no, it's not really like that, it must be like this, and then he'd go, oh, yes, and then he'd run a time when something to do with that occurred, and then something else, and then he'd suddenly cognite, and then I'd sit there listening to this, and I'd think, oh, my God, yeah, that's right. And I think I got at least as much uh, cognitions and so on from auditing him as I did from any sessions on myself. So uh, I guess that's a little plug for training and uh, becoming an auditor, too. Anyway, it was very interesting, and um, I CS'd him on his solo knots, and he went on and eventually completed solo knots, and... Uh, asked me to write up all the materials of Solo Knots and export it, which I did in, uh, when was it, 1980, toward the end of 1980, around September, October, I believe October of 1980. Solo Knots was then later released to the world. Um, LRH had actually completed his own Solo Knots at some point prior to that. And that was... Uh, to a large degree, why the Mark VI was developed. Now, I got a tremendous amount of experience during that time on, not just on the subject of knots and solo knots, but also on how one goes about researching new technology and developing it and piloting it and so on. And it was also very interesting from my point of view, having been there and audited him throughout on that technique, when faced with, now, how do you train another auditor on this, and what would he have to know in order to be able to do it? And that's quite a uh, an educational thing in itself, looking at it from that point of view. If you already know how to do something, then you have to figure out, well, what would somebody else have to know in order to be able to do the same thing? And um, <clears throat> going on from there, after LRH completed... Um, Solo Knots, he went on, continued on with solo auditing, researching the levels above that, and eventually completed up through uh, what's called OT11. I used to, I didn't CS those levels, but he used to send me his, um, I used to see his, he used to send me his solo sessions, and he used to send me briefings and so on. Um, there was a point where I, at that, up through up to a certain point, I used to live in the same apartments and so on with him and see him from day to day. Uh, and then he moved away to another place. And uh, after that, he used to keep me briefed by correspondence on his research, basically because he wanted me to be able to continue on with uh, that technical hat and uh, take it over from him when he left the body. And um, there's a dispatch that's often been mentioned by various people, and I'll mention it again today, uh, because there's not a great deal known about it, that I received in April of 1982. And I consider it one of the most significant dispatches that I've received from LRH. But in April of 1982, I got this dispatch from him, and it was about 20-odd pages long, um, single space typed, it was quite a long one, and he described what he expected to happen in the future and over the next 20 to 25 years. And part of that dispatch was that uh, although he'd been training me to do this for some time and I'd known that he wanted me to be able to uh, carry on and release these OT levels when the time came, um, in this dispatch he actually stated it, formally stated it in writing that that's what he wanted me to do. And at the time, he said he was actually turning the hat over. 
He also told me at the time that he expected to live for uh, a minimum of a few months and perhaps a couple of years at the most. And there were several paragraphs in which he asked me, uh, uh, he told me not to get upset about the idea of him dropping his body and so on, and uh, pointed out, and I'm mentioning this because I think it's relevant and I think most people should know it, that um, it wasn't something to be sad about or anything. He'd accomplished what he'd set out to accomplish in this lifetime, which was basically to map out the bridge. And he'd done that, and uh, he wanted to be able to... And he said that even if it was possible to extend his life, he didn't particularly have any great desire to do so. In this body, he wanted to go on and be able to uh, start a new game. And he also estimated that he would be gone for some time. He didn't say doing what. But he said he would be, and he asked me basically to look after um, three things to do with the tech. One was uh, overseeing the quality of delivery of tech by other people and to ensure that it, uh, high quality delivery continued. Um, to look over the actual technical materials from time to time because they would need updating as society changed and then at suitable times in the future to release the as yet unreleased OT levels. And he's made a point in there that by the time I and others had gotten up through these levels ourselves, we would find that it was possible to continue on uh, with the research ourselves and that he felt that the future was now secure in that he didn't have to be around forever to continue on mapping the route out. He'd done sufficient on that and he therefore felt that he'd fulfilled his goals and what he called his obligations to mankind and could go off and do something else but he said he would check back in in 25, 20 to 25 years to ensure it was all going well and so on. And that's another aspect of that dispatch that I don't think has been mentioned before. Although it didn't seem very significant at the time, a few months after that I got another dispatch from him which was the last of the what I would call significant dispatches and it was more of an administrative type dispatch rather than technical, and he asked me to start thinking about how I should organize myself and my staff in order to be able to fulfill the duties that he'd stated in the earlier dispatch. And he said that I would have to reorganize things differently from the way they were. There was a little explanation um, to the effect that people who are involved in tech, or technical people, and people who are involved in day-to-day -day administration often don't see things the same way in the inside the organization. And he pointed out that the technical people often are more concerned with the purity of the tech and its application, whereas some of the administrative people tend to have their attention on stats more than the tech, and that this can cause a variance, I, he, I think it was quite understated, it said that it could cause a variance or a difference in viewpoints on how things should be done. And as I say, some of the full significance of it didn't dawn on me at the time, but he said that in addition to thinking about how to organize my unit so as to be able to fulfill the purposes and duties that he'd laid out in the earlier dispatch, he said that I should also consider a possible different corporate and organizational basis in which to operate because of the fact that technical people and administrative people aren't ne don't necessarily and aren't necessarily seeing things the same way. And um, I won't go so far as to say that uh, he predicted or necessarily suggested what came about later, but looking back on it now, um, it may well be that way, that he may have anticipated what was going to happen over the next few years in 
the rest of 82 and 83 and so on. And um, whether it was exactly what he defined at the time or not, uh, looking back on it now, we certainly did change our corporate and organizational status. And uh, I feel that that was actually necessary in order to be able to carry out the responsibilities laid out in that dispatch, because under the old system, there would be no way where I or anybody else could have um, undertaken to guarantee the purity of the tech as other considerations became more important. Anyway, that brings us basically up to date. And uh, as I said earlier, this was going to be the last in the series of uh, talks about my experiences with LRH. Um, during that time, there was the technical breakthrough of the HRD and various other things. But I feel that <clears throat> I've described the more significant technical breakthroughs and uh, so we'll conclude this, this particular series at that point in 82. And of course, subsequently, I haven't had any direct, um, since people often ask, the last time I received a direct communication from LRH, it was in the middle of 1982. So anyway, that completes that series. And although there have been a number of criticisms from the old organization about us doing things differently. Um, we, don't, we, we do make an effort to try to emulate as much as we can of what they do. And so therefore, next Sunday afternoon, instead of the barbecue, we'll be serving beans and rice. Well, that wasn't part of the series, but I thought it was a good way to wind up. Thank you. Well, that concludes the barbecue for today. Don't forget we have our Christmas party, December 16th, and you can stop by the center and get directions to where it is. That's about it. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you next week.